Uh, well, young Shai lived in a flat for two and a half years in the 10th floor, and I had five children on. And we found that uh, whenever we did eventually get a house out of it, the kids, for a long time, we just sort of couldn't get them out to play with other kids. Whenever they were out in the street, every five minutes they were running back into the house, they just couldn't mix with other children. These children don't seem to have any such problem. They appear to be like any others, coming home from school, happy to exchange the enclosed classroom for the open air. Or are they? Let's look more closely at what they're coming back to. This is a redevelopment area just off the new Lodge Road in Belfast. In a site of about 60 acres, the corporation has built a variety of houses, maisonettes, old people's dwellings and flats. It's in these 12-storey blocks that half the families in the estate must live, and from the roof of any one of them, you can see the sort of buildings they replace. Dense slums. The perpetual problem facing the planner, trying to improve on houses like these, is that people living in any one area are reluctant to move to another, even for a new home. Understandably, they're afraid of losing contact with relations and neighbours, especially at the moment when political as well as social pressures weigh heavily. If houses only were used in redevelopment, three out of ten people could be rehoused in the area. But where there are high flats as well, six out of ten can return. In this flat, Mr and Mrs McElroy live with their three children. With two neighbours for company, Mrs McElroy talked to us. She liked the flats, but having five people in a two-bedroom flat a hundred-odd feet above the city imposed a strain which her friendliness couldn't hide. Well, there's a, there's a double bed for her because... I've got a double bed for her because the, the wee girl, the other wee one, she'd be getting into her bed. But I have a double bed and the cot and a single bed for the wee boy. The three of them is in the, the one room because um, the baby nurse told me that there's no children should be in with their parents sleeping. Like, she's over a year, you know, she's, she should be out of our room anyway, you know. So I've, I've moved her into their room. How do you like it? I like it all right, and it's all right for me and my husband. We like it, but for the children, there's, there's nothing for the children here. Like, they're, they're just cooped up in the hen house, that's all it is, the land, you know. There's nowhere for them to play. There's nothing, that, 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 there's nobody to play with. They have to go down a couple of floors, and if they go down the back stairs, there's cement stairs there. They fell, they, they break their head, or they smash their wee head open, or something like that. What do you do with the two girls during the day? They just have to, they just have to play with each other, or I try and amuse them as much as I can, because they can't go out onto the land to play, because there's, uh, there's, the land's too slippy for them. Do they never meet any other children of their own age? Not unless it's a good day and I take them down outside the door to sit and play out there. Do you think this has any effect on them? It has that wee girl there, this wee one here. She can't mix. She can't mix with anybody or any children. Sure she can. It's true a child can be terribly lonely in this concrete wasteland called redevelopment. There's an emptiness. It makes children look out of place. The towering 12-storey block threatening. The tiny fragile contents, a puff of wind could blow them away. But children, fortunately, are resilient. Most of them can adapt to their surroundings, especially when they've known others. But what of a child who's been born and lived always in a high flat? It's an unnatural life, and to most of us in Northern Ireland, a strange one. Mrs. Corr has got used to waiting for the lift and to bringing her little girl up ten storeys, or about a hundred feet, to home. It's a long way behind closed doors. Mrs. Corr, how do you like high flat life? Well, I don't like it very much. Not for the children, you know. How long have you been living in this Five flats? years. Do you find there are any problems, especially with the children? Oh, yes, with the lift, you know, with the big pram, it's hard, you know. But nonetheless. If you could get a flat, say, on the ground floor, would you like that? Well, I'd prefer a house, you know, till a flat. Why? What's the advantage of a house? Well, you have a garden, you know, and then you have a front door, like you can always go in and out to front. You know? What's going to happen when the children grow older? 
I don't know, unless the corporation gives me a house, I'll probably have to stay in the flat. How many children have you got now? Three. Have you enough room for them? Well, they're wee girls, you know. Lucky enough with the two rooms. What about nursery school? I have one wee boy at the nursery school. He's four. And the other wee girl will be in the end of the year, if they went until she's three. How does Paul get on at the nursery school? He loves the nursery school. He cries when he's coming home from it because he knows that he's coming back here to nobody just to play with his two sisters and they're too young for him. There's no wee boys up here for him to play with. Nursery school is the one feature of the estate that saves the day both for the children and their parents. There are two on the site, and by working a shift system they can just about cope with the kids from the flats. But this is only by turning away 70% of the applicants. That includes many living in appalling housing nearby. I wondered why the school principal considered the needs of one group to be particularly pressing. Do you find that the children from the flats are different in any way from those from houses around? They're not different as children uh, of their natures and it very soon shows that they are just like other children. But when they're starting the nursery, they certainly are different. Uh, there are really two differences. Uh, I suppose it depends on the type of child. Some children are so pent up and, and uh, frustrated in their attempts to investigate the outside world by the time they come to us three, that they come in with a rush of energy and uh, excitement that makes them seem very aggressive. And at first, when I saw a child of this type, I really thought that the child might be a little unbalanced because it was so wildly excitable that it would have driven the pram right through someone else or uh, jumped over the furniture rather than go round it or uh, seize a paintbrush and paint the wall instead of a paper and uh, really was very difficult. But I found that we don't need to worry about these children at all when they come in with that terrific excitability because a few weeks in the free atmosphere and the uh, wealth of material that nursery school provides uh, satisfies them so much that they can settle down and concentrate on the material the way the other children do. However, there's another type of child uh, that uh, after some years in the flats uh, takes a different, has a different effect and it becomes, it gives up the battle I think to, to investigate the world and to overcome its mother's objections to letting it out and it begins to withdraw into itself and becomes very quiet and just wants to sit in a corner and finds very difficult to let it to stay here without its mother. Do you think that the quieter child has been permanently affected? I should think it quite likely. We do know, uh, and, and uh, educationalists know, that there are stages for certain types of development. And for mixing with other children, a uh, three-year-old is about the normal time that children uh, wish to do this. And we know that if the, it's impossible for a child to uh, do these things at the right stages, often it's very, very difficult. And from what I have seen of these children afterwards, I do think that they would be the type of person who would be easily upset all through their life and the type of person that breaks down under a big blow. Do you think that the children impose a strain on their parents? I think the children in the flats impose a very great strain on their parents. I think that once they, they become conscious that they want to get out and they can't get out, they become angry with their parents and they can very easily uh, grow up a resentment between them in which the parent begins to feel that he's got a very naughty child. That's the first thing. And when they take them out to the friends' houses, they show this excitability that they showed to us at the start. And they, they can't help seeing that their friends feel they're a very naughty child. And it, it, it's really, it causes great difficulty in the relationship between the mother and child. But apart from that, there is 
uh, a great strain on mothers who have more than one ch child living in flats because the purely practical problem of getting prams and toddlers up and down the stairs. And I feel that some of the mothers that I have known here are strained below, beyond the limit of endurance with this. Also, we find that they never know each other unless they meet them somewhere like a nursery school or perhaps they might meet in the local grocers, but they don't really uh, get to know each other well unless they're somewhere like the nursery that they're meeting very regularly. So you're really a community centre for the parents as well? Yes, we do find that. And, and the mothers really tell us how much the nursery school is meant to, to them in the way of getting to know their neighbours and we notice that they begin to babysit for each other and of course we have a good mother's club through that here too running. And after school, what then? There's the old play area designed by the planners, ignored by the children. They'd prefer to improvise with a few sheets of corrugated iron on a piece of landscaped concrete. The one large open space, part of an old military barracks, is now a football pitch. There are three or four swings in a distant corner and an old recreation hall for at least 1,500 children. The corporation promises better facilities and an urban motorway overhead by 1976. This, this area we're in now was the original play, play area. We had swings here, which were over in this section over here. But unfortunately, they had to be taken away. The old age pensioners along, who live along in these houses here at the back, the kids were swinging on these things here at all hours of the night and day. So the next thing is they just had to take the swings away. So we moved the swings over to the area over here. We have an expansive waste land just outside our hall here. And we have taken the swings over there, put them back up again. They're away from the houses and flats. Apart from swings, have you got anything else on this wasteland? We, <coughs> yeah, we have uh, the making of a football pitch. We had our football post and whatnot put up. What do you hope to do with the hall? Well, the hall we have in use seven nights a week during the summer months in July. This was the only uh, this was the only centre that was open during the summer months. Uh, we were open seven days a week, uh, from two o'clock in the afternoon to ten o'clock at night. Who are you catering for in the club? Well, we try to cater for all ages, you know. Uh, we, we would like to uh, cater for, it's basically for the kids, but we'd like to bring in something for the old age pensioners, uh, more or less as a community centre, rather than just a, a club, you know, for kids. We, this is the primary interest. That's one way of getting rid of surplus energy. There are others, and they're the ones we read about. The ones that get these young people and these areas a bad reputation. If there's trouble in this area or that one, this week or next, remember that only some frustration can be worked out on a few mats and half a dozen ropes. Yeah, I think it's inevitable if you get people living in conditions like this here, you get kids running around the streets at night, it's, there's nothing better to do with themselves. All it takes is one spark to start it off. So the next thing is, you know, there's everybody's running around mad all over the place. You, you know, it's just one of these things. People living in these flats, they, they're confined. The children are confined. I mean, they must have some out, outlet for their energies. And it's just unfortunate this happens to be, in the past, one of the outlets, you know. I think it has a bearing to an extent on it, you know.